Oh, all right. This is the first uh, episode of Free Range Aviation Specials, where I am going to be uh, exploring the world of aviation this year. And you're my first guest for Free Range Aviation. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Ivan, thank Ivan, you so much. Ivan is here with us from Dallas, Fort Worth area. Mm-hmm. You uh, retired from the Army? Yes, I retired from the Army after 20 years. That was back in 2017 now. Okay, okay. Yeah. And you were a Chinook pilot. Yes, sir. I was a, I actually started uh, first four years were in the Air Force as a military, well, security forces. Oh, God. In the Air Force. This is going <laughs> to get that's real. The, yeah, we're going to, yeah, I'm sure we'll get The real that. beret warriors are here, <laughs> yeah. everybody. We all know, what is it? They used to say SF. Yeah. That's part of the SF. It's but um, the SF. Yeah, know. transitioned from, uh, from the Air Force to the Army as a uh, warrant officer, then flew there. For the next uh, 16 uh, years, retired wow. in 2017. So you grew up uh, kind of close to where me and Dave did. You said you went to high school in Spanaway? Yes. Yeah, so um, I am a, uh, I'm an Army brat. My dad was in the Army as well. So I'd, I've gone to school up in Fort Hood here, Fort Lewis, uh, quite a few places all around. But yes, I did go to school up in, in Tacoma, Washington. Oh, yes. All too familiar with that area. So... How did, did you get actively recruited while you were in the Air Force uh, for the, the warrant officer program or how did that come up, come about? You know, to be honest with you, all I've, all I ever wanted to do was be around airplanes. And so that's why my dad was in the army, told me to join the Air Force. So I joined the Air Force. Once I got to the Air Force, um, remember I was telling you about the, uh, about Airman Leadership School and yeah. getting a ride in F-16. Well, <laughs> interestingly enough, I, I didn't think I was smart enough to be a pilot. But when I did this ride, the guy that was showing me how to do all the egress stuff on the F-16 and all kinds of stuff like that, he seemed like a normal person. He didn't seem like he was a rocket scientist or anything like that. So that actually convinced me to become a pilot. And after that, while I was in the Air Force, then I started applying for anything and everything that would take me. And I had a pulse and two feet, two hands, and the Army said yes. <laughs> so, so I looked into the Warrant Officer Candidate Program, yeah. And where where is that school at? Fort Rucker, Alabama. So so that's where warrant officer candidate is? Everything, that is the home of Army aviation. Every every Army guy will tell you that, yeah. And yeah, so walk us through, you show up at Fort Rucker, you were E5 in the military or in the Air Force at the time. And now what? So I was a staff sergeant in the Air Force. Um, Just getting that approved took a lot. I had to do all, there was no, most of the time, most people say, well, go to the, uh, go to a recruiter and the recruiter will help you and will teach you or show you what to do. Well, I had to do all that stuff on my own. And uh, the senior mass sergeant in my squadron, uh, they wouldn't sign my paperwork to go to the army. They wouldn't let me do an inter-service transfer. They didn't want me to do it. Not the senior, it was somebody else that wouldn't sign. I don't know if it was a commander or something. So I explained the, the, the whole story to the senior. He had the stuff signed and then I was on my way to the, to the army. Thankfully, I didn't have to do Army basic training, which I don't know how I didn't have to do that. I went straight to walk school. Yeah, that's what I was curious about. Like, <laughs> did you you yeah. show up with no uniforms? Nope. Uh, <laughs> no, pretty much like one day I got out of the Air Force and the next day I signed into the Army. I think I had my butt checked again at MEPS. I don't know, something like that. I had to do it again. And then, um, so they said, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I asked for it <laughs> twice. Um, so I show up and it, it was pretty significant change. So you go from the air force to the army. Yeah. Now, granted when I was security forces at the air force, not like I was treated very well, neither. I mean, I'll just leave that where it's at. Uh, so I went to the, I show up at Fort Rucker, Alabama, right into walk school. And it was pretty significant, uh, change in the way we're used to doing things from, what then was the Air Force to what the Army was back then as well. So it was a, it was kind of a shock and awe moment for me. And, uh, but, you know, I was ready to do it. I was excited to do it. And I couldn't tell you how long it was, but. Yeah, what is the first few weeks like? Like, like you, again, like you don't have any uniforms or nothing. Like, so what did you do day one? Central issue facility, CIF, yeah. go yeah. get all your shit and uh and to be honest with you man like to keep it simple 
I just followed what the guy in front of me did, which is generally what you, I, I tend to try not to be the first guy. Cause usually the first guy is the one that gets jacked up. So I just kind of <laughs> followed what everybody else and fell in line with what everybody else was doing. And that worked out for me. So if somebody was like an army things like, you know, standing at parade rest all the time and screaming something with a salute from like three and a half miles away. So like I did all that stuff just like everybody else did. And it kind of <laughs> helped me stay out of the radar where when I went to Air Force basic training, I showed up with a bright orange shirt and I didn't know that you generally try not to do that. Don't be the guy that stands out. So I showed up and automatically I was the, I don't know, dorm chief or something like that. So I was getting hollered at. So I learned from that. So I showed up and just fell in line with all the army guys and warrant officer candidate school is just like any, it's like officer basic training for warrant officers. Yeah. Uh, when talking about the history of the warrant officer and kind of what, what led to what we have now and kind of what the intent of the warrant officer is. And, and that was all learning all those basic things, uh, things before we go into flight school and flight mode. And so when you guys graduate warrant officer candidate school, like you, you're mixed in with like, you know, chemo, chemo and all yep. the other warrants that are going somewhere, like mm -hmm. maybe some SF guys yep. that are going warrant. So then you guys finish that and now you're over on the flight side of Rucker. Correct. And, and what, how does army flight school work? Like how does it, is basic pilot first and then mm -hmm. and what do you guys fly? So there's something called, uh, so yes, while we're going through, through that basic portion, you're with all kinds of warrants. We call them walking warrants. It's typically the term that you'll hear. SF warrants, uh, chem guys, logistics guys, and and the warrant is really known as most people in the army community. Uh, it's this an SME subject matter expert. Yeah. Usually the guys that are doing that are your guys that know what's going on. They've, they've, they've gone as far as they can go on their enlisted side. And now they're looking to be specialized in this one thing. And they are that guy that the commanders go to for that information, for that, how to achieve whatever it is that they're trying to achieve. And that's kind of the, where the warrant kind of falls in in line. And it's the same way for aviation. Uh, once we get done with uh, walk school, and again, I'm having to go back a, a few years in time, we got done there. And uh, what we did is we went into IRW. Uh, it's called the Initial Entry Rotary Wing. So we're in the Air Force, I think it's called what? Um, uh, UPT, Undergraduate Pilot Training yeah. in different phases. That's kind of like our UPT. And uh, back in those days, uh, we used to, uh, we used a, a helicopter called the, the TH-67, which is essentially a Bell Jet Ranger, a 206, mm -hmm. kind of like your weatherman helicopter, your yeah. news type helicopter. And we go right into that. So you go from zero, zero flying, zero experience in helicopters. I've never touched one before other than learning the very basics of aerodynamics and how a helicopter works. And you're at the controls, just like any, uh, it's aviation is interesting. Yeah, they, it's like, so you're there, you know, is ground school mixed into that. Are they doing it like a little of both or do you start with all your groundwork stuff? They teach you weather, they teach you like how aircraft and airports work and things like that. I think that's, that's essentially what it is. It's all kind of that crawl, walk, run method. Um, so you, you'll do all your systems type stuff, systems training, uh, you know, whether it's some of these guys have never worked a radio in their life. They have never yeah. flown. They, so we talk all those things and then you start moving on to what's called kind of like a flight training device, which is all just pushing buttons and then just getting that rote uh, memorization of movements, buttons, how, what I press sequences of how I want to press buttons, what limitations uh, and emergency procedure training, which is the main thing really in flight training is EPs and limits. That's yeah. what you need to know first. And then everything else kind of falls in line. And you start working towards building, the, then moving out to the actual flight line. And I think most most flying flight training in most places is generally set up in the same way. It's kind of like crawl, walk, run. And then once you get out to the flight line, now we're putting it all together. And it's, you know, you get out there, you get, the instructor will take it. Usually an instructor, most of the time the instructors are, are uh, DACs, Department of Army Civilians. Yeah. Guys with a lot of uh, experience. And they put you on the controls and sink or swim kind of deal, wow. you know? So here you go. How many, how many people fall out in that phase? I would think I, I couldn't give you a number per se, but I do know that they did 
get washed out or rolled back yeah. because that is, that's kind of the... You have some people quit too, I'm sure. Oh, I'm, it, not, there's, I'm there's, there's always guys like that, that they just can't, because it's a dynamic environment, just like any kind of, any job that encompasses thinking, moving, talking, shooting, scooting, communicating, yeah. all that stuff. Uh, and some guys just, I hate to say it. I mean, I, not that I'm better than anybody else, but they just can't do two things yeah. at the same time. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Now, um, at what point do you guys start chasing your platform that you want? Like, do you have a say in it? Do you like, so as you're going through here, were you like, man, I really want 64s. So I'm, I'm going to say, it sucks. I'm going to say this and guys are going to hear it. And they're going to be like, really, Yvonne? Really? <laughs> so I actually wanted to be a, oh gosh, I actually wanted to be a 64 pilot. I wanted to be an H64 pilot. because Who doesn't? To- Anybody that makes fun of you is is lying to themselves. Well, what's the movie with uh, what's his name where he was a sixty four pi- Firebirds uh, or something? Yeah, Firebirds. Like that? So everybody wants Nicholas Cage, yeah, and Tommy Lee Jones. Everybody wants to be that guy, you know. Um, and I wanted to blow shit up. I really did. That's all I ever wanted to do, and I think most guys do. Um, but uh, there was a guy in my class. So to answer your question specifically, before we get in down that rabbit hole, is from the start. Yeah, because it's all based on OML. Yeah. Order mer- merit list. So if you fail something, if you do something not as good as the other guy, so you start, you start getting so graded do they, right away. Do they update this list every day? I don't know that they update it every day, but I'm sure there's probably by stage. So as yeah. you start moving through stages of training, it gets, uh, it gets um, updated. For some guys, they suck from the get-go. So they yeah. just know that they're going to f- get what they get. But there was quite a few of us that had a specific airframe that we wanted to go for. And we know that if you're number one, you get to pick. If you're number two, you get to pick. By the time you're number 10, like you're getting whatever's left. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So it works It works that way. So I wanted to be a 64 driver and so happened to be that there was a guy, I won't say his name. I'll just say his name is Golden Boy. Golden Pe- Boy. Golden Boy. Uh, he was an armament guy on 64s. And uh, and what's funny is the people that know him will know who he is, Golden Boy. Um <laughs> He was an armament guy on the 64 and he was just really good at everything. Like every time they asked him for an emergency procedure, he could say it. The only thing that he had to do is he had to roll his shoulders before he answered every question every time, but he would answer it (laughs) every time, like spot on. So one day I told him, I was like, golden boy, don't roll your, your shoulders. Next time you answer a question, just do it for me. So he, they asked him a question because they're in stand up the start of the class, they'll pick a guy and say, all right, lost tail rotor effectiveness, you know, uncommanded rapid ride yaws does not subside of its own accord. And he tried to not roll his shoulders and he couldn't speak. So I was like, gosh, I finally found his weakness. He just, if you just don't make him roll, then maybe I can pass this guy and I can be number one on the class. But he kept rolling his, his shoulders and he answered all the questions. So there was one spot for, there was one slot for 64s when it came. So we're nearing the end of, uh, IERW. Yeah. Um, and now they put all these, they put all the aircraft up on a board and they put little tick marks next to them and they say, okay, they go right down the OML and they say, all right, golden boy, you're first because you're number one. And he grabbed the 64, which I knew he would. And then right after that, there was Chinooks, uh, by, back then it was D model Chinooks. So those steam gauge Chinooks. And then after that, there were some, a couple of 58 spots, Kyle Warriors, which are no yeah. longer flying Come now. On. Yeah. yeah. Those guys like shooting stuff. I love the Kyle. Yeah. Uh, everybody likes Kyle, Kyle guys. They, they shoot everything. <laughs> they, they fight each other quite a bit. Yeah, uh, yeah, I have yeah, some yeah. stories yeah. about Ky- that stuff. Kyle's will go h- hover behind the enemy and shoot at him with yeah. their own rifles. <laughs> well, they'll just fly really low and slow, hoping that somebody will shoot at them so then they can shoot back. So it takes a specific uh, mentality and really awesome guys. They're all awesome dudes. Um, so anyways, Golden Boy takes that. So it's Chinooks and Black, uh, excuse me, not Blackhawks, Kiowas and then Blackhawks. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm one or the other. I don't really like to fiddle with the lines. I'm either one way or the other. So for me, it was all guns or all cargo. Mm-hmm. So when it wasn't all guns, I went all cargo. And I'm, I'm super happy that I did because the Chinook's an amazing platform. Yeah. So that's how I got it, man. I, I'm... For you guys out there, I love the Chinook. That's my thing. But I, I do like Apache guys and I love them. I love you guys. Where did you, so then where is Chinook school? Is it right there? At all there. Yep. It's all there. Um, there's different stage fields. 
just like the Air Force has different places where they do training and they'll go kind of shoot from Fort Rucker and go do different things in different spots, depending on the mission set that they're trying to work on. So I went to a place called Knox and at Knox um, stay, uh, Airfield, from there we kind of launched, that's like the launching pad for all the training every day. And every day we would, we would come out, um, um, do a little bit of table talk, talk about what we're going to do. Uh, which I have a funny story about that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and execute the mission or the training, come back, debrief, just like any military operation, and then reset, rearm, and do it again. Um, but the cool thing is that I was an instructor pilot for most of the time that I was flying in the military. And I already know that instructor pilots like to talk. That's why I can do this. Because <laughs> they just like talking. You All you have to do is get the ball rolling and just let it be and autopilot, you're good to go. So I knew um, this guy, I'll just call him Pork Chops. The guys in the Chino community will know who that guy is, Pork Chop. Um, <laughs> I knew that he loved to talk about Germany and the Huey and his dogs. So my friend, Bobby, my stick buddy, uh, Bobby, I would tell Bobby like every time before we go, because I don't want to answer questions for 30 minutes because they'll just jab you the whole time. It's yeah. tough. And I was like, so what I'll do is I'll just bring up Germany and Hueys and dogs and that should get us through. So every time before we'd go get ready to fly, I'd be like, hey, so question about the Huey. Can you tell me about, so that type of rotor system, how does that work? And then he would start talking. <laughs> and then he would look at his watch. He's like, oh man, we got to get ready to go flying. I'm like, oh yeah, let's try it. So let's go flying. We'd go flying, come back. And then when we get back, I'd ask him something about his dog. I'm like, so what kind of dog do you have? And then he would start talking about his dog and he would never cover any of the stuff that we were supposed to. <laughs> so that's kind of how I, that's how me and Bobby managed to, uh, to avoid all the hard questions. So, I mean, we try, I don't think he ever caught on to it. Like we did it every day. No, that's, I mean, for anybody that it hasn't been through flight training, I mean, that's what it is. You're, yeah taken off and then you're just grilled the entire time. Yeah, the <laughs> but, whole time. Okay, so what's this? So what's this? What's this? You're just like, uh. And it's on purpose. That's what That's what I was telling you yeah. with the whole being able to do two, th two things at the same time. Like it's a dynamic environment, constantly changing, constantly evolving, constantly there's something added. So I like to tell people that we're, we're in a, uh, the, what's the terminology that I'm looking for? We're in a contingency driven operation. So if you're not thinking about how you're going to deal with it, and I'm sure you're aware of that, yeah. if you're not thinking about how you're going to deal when it happens. Or you're what ifing everything to death. Yeah. Then you're already, and that's why we have walkthroughs and rock drills and everybody's like, well, what if the engine falls off? I'm like, really? Okay. Well, I guess if the engine falls off, this is what we're going to do, you know? And so it's, it's kind of, that's part of you that. You had an engine fall off of a Chinook? Just fall off? You know, not me, <laughs> it would not, I would not put it past any of us that perhaps at some point in time, <laughs> somebody, I've had a loose, like uh, something called a drag link that yeah. there's supposed to be a little bit of play in it. I won't get into super specifics, but there's supposed to be a little play, but I've seen like the bolt literally come off. So, but that doesn't mean the engine yeah. falls off. And if it fell off, you know, to be honest with you, nothing would happen. <laughs> we'd be fine. Like we'd be good to go. That's not a big deal. Just auto rotate and roll with it. Yeah. It's not a bit. We would still continue to fly, to be honest with you. The Chinook's that kind of, that kind of airframe. We wow. would be like, all right, good to go. Like, yeah, it would suck. Cause then we'd probably have to one, do hands uh, across the earth trying to find where the engine landed. But yeah. One went down recently in El Paso, like a couple of years ago, didn't it? Uh, you're talking, I think there was some training. It, yeah. It was backing into the hill and then it rolled. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, don't quote me cause okay. I'm not an investigator. I'm not even close to it. I'm just a dude dressed as a dude trying to act like another dude. <laughs> um, hopefully I got that right. Um, but we do what's called two wheel pinnacle. Everybody's seen it. They see like the cool pictures and they're like, oh, that must be the most amazingly hard thing to do. And it's really not hard in a Chinook if you're trained correctly. But my assumption is that perhaps maybe they touched a blade or something. And a Chinook, as soon as you touch a blade, all those blades sit 120 degrees apart. So there's 120 degrees between each. As soon as you hit something, everything goes out of balance. Yeah. And what happens when things go out of balance? Perhaps you can mesh rotors and run into each other. So we like to say Chinook's one of the few aircraft that can have a mitter with itself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there's sink shafts that keep those things from not happening. But if you break something and it goes out of sync... 
you can run in these because they do cross, you know, when, wow. when they're turning. Yeah. <laughs> Most people think they don't, but they actually do. So if you get out of sync, these will run into each other forward and aft rotor head. So my assumptions, perhaps something like that happened. Um, but, and usually the way things like that happen is ground gives from underneath the aircraft. Yeah. And then we still, you if you're not Johnny on the spot, which I've had things like that happen to me. It's just you, if you get to a point where you can feel things, seat of the, we call it seat of the pants flying, where you can just feel what the airplane is doing and you're able to adjust from it. Or I've just been really lucky to catch those things before it's uh, snowballed. And we've had some aircraft losses in previous units that I've been in where that's happened and everybody's passed in those in Afghanistan yeah. in previous years. So yeah, it's kind of a, not a cool thing. Um, doesn't happen a whole lot. Uh, with army aircraft, but we're doing dynamic missions and dynamic environments that are not normal for most people. How so. long was the Chinook portion specifically? So, I mean, oh. you're, they're, they're mainly, now you know how to fly. Mm -hmm. so now it's getting you familiar with the actual cockpit instruments and things in that specific helicopter, what its limitations are mm -hmm. and emergency procedures. And well, before I even get into that, that was the biggest jump. The Chinook is such a systems intensive aircraft that it's, it's most of the time people will ask me things about it and I can go into this long dissertation about what the differences are. And they're like, well, you know, because <laughs> the guy that created that aircraft was like on another level. So it took quite a while. Now, specific timelines, I'll be honest with you. I don't remember. I know that it was probably somewhere in the range of like maybe four, five, six months, something like that. Yeah. And I'm sure somebody's going to comment and say like, no, dude, it's not the right time frame. I'm like, I'm just being honest with you. Uh, but during that time, you go from the basics of understanding ZPs and limits to then the basics of scan flow startup procedures and how you do it and not look like an idiot. To then the very first day that it's such an advanced aircraft that now when they give you and they say, all right, you got the controls, it's got a lot of computers that work to help you keep that thing because it's inherently unstable. It's not a stable platform. Yeah. The Chinook, there's something called digital AFCS and dumbing that down, that just means it takes whatever's going on and it's like an, it helps you fly the airplane. When the airplane's like, I'm going to do this. Well, I got you. I'll help you out. So you're doing your normal pilot thing, wiggling the yeah, The sticks. Apache has that too, doesn't yeah. it? Because I, I would have him, I've done the Apache sim quite a few times and I would have you're him turn lucky. it all off. I didn't get to do an Apache sim and I tried. I've got like 12 hours in that thing. So you're pretty much an Apache pilot. I, I, I know my way around a tank. I think spot. what we do is we get a Chinook and an Apache and we go do missions. Yeah. You, you sit high bird and I'll just like come in and say some stuff and <laughs> we're like shooting Nerf guns. Well, we can fly the Huey over there in a minute. <laughs> oh, that's right. Simulator. I'm a sim geek. So we, oh, we're yeah. good to go. All right. <laughs> so, um, so we do that and we kind of build up and really that now this thing is called flight school 21 during that time frame. I don't know if it's changed now, but it was called flight school 21. It's this concept where then we take you from basic helicopter flying skills to an advanced aircraft. And then essentially they try to do as much as they can. But the best way to explain is they teach you how kind of not to kill yourself, understand the basics. So then when you get out to your unit, which is just like most military training. Then you get there and then you get that OJT. Now we're going to show you how to, how to, how to really do it. Extrapolate all the capability of that aircraft to its utmost, which takes years. And so, yeah, where, where did you go upon graduating Chinook school? Then where is your first duty station? What year is that? So this is like in 2006 ish, five ish, some time frame there. And from there I went to Fort ain't right. I mean, Fort Wayne wrong. I mean, Fort, Fort Wainwright. Wainwright, Fort Wainwright, Alaska. Yeah. Uh, okay. And I went there to a unit called the Sugar Bears. Uh, and there... Um, That's funny because I was deployed in 2005 with the 172nd. Really? Yeah. So. Isn't that something? It's it, You know, it seems like every time I meet somebody, it's like, hey, dude, I was there back in 08. Well, I was back there in 08. <laughs> you know, it's, it's always one of those things. But um, so I go to Alaska and it's pretty nice because... Quite a few of the guys have been to Alaska and you know yeah, that Alaska- You just got a job flying helicopters in Alaska? I Fuck know, off. I know. <laughs> here's, here's the funny part. I had, I'll, you'll know about, there's a guy that had Korea. No, I had Korea. Yeah. He had Alaska. And he's like, dude, I really want to go to Korea. I'm like, you want to go to Korea? I'll take that. I was like, <laughs> you have Alaska, right? 
I have career. I was like, I'll switch you if you want. He's like, that would be great. And he was like so happy that I hooked him up. And the whole time, I'm like, I mean, dude. both are pretty cool places to fly. Yeah, out they are. I mean, yeah, yeah, but in Korea, it's restrictive, man. I've yeah. flown in Korea. It, I mean, it's cool to say that you flew like close to the DMZ and all that stuff. And you, and I've done all that, got the t-shirt, punched that ticket. But there is no substitute for, and I don't care if it's helicopters, airplanes, gyrocopters, fucking balloons. Like there's no place better than Alaska to like really learn how to fly. Yeah. Like hands down. So when I went to Afghanistan, like the terrain there is very similar. Yeah. So when I was operating there, I was like, dude, this is just like flying Alaska. So it was just not a thing. It wasn't yeah. like, oh gosh, what am I going to do? You know what I mean? <laughs> You're not coming from sea level and... And, and learning that's altitude huge, the first time you're in country. And that's a huge thing, especially guys that came from Iraq and then they went to Afghanistan. They're fl- trying to fly the aircraft like they were flying back in and whatever. For yeah. those that don't fly helicopters, your power is significantly limited when, as you are going up in altitude. So that's correct. The bird flies a completely different way at sea level than it does, you know, even in El Paso. El Paso is at 4,500 4, feet. So it's like you're already. <laughs> and that's and a you disadvantage. Know. Not that hey, you, you guys have a little bit more power to kick around, but we do. I mean, the thing is that there's a misconception that because we have a lot of power that we fly like we have a lot of power. It's, it's kind of like that big dude in the gym that actually knows that he's big. So he doesn't need to show off to everybody that he's big. So we don't need to do that. So we fly because. Because when we're, we fly with that knowledge, because when we operate, most of the times we will be at max gross weight, yeah. max gross weight, meaning the most that I can take off and fly with. Mm-hmm. And, and I know that at those weights, if I fly like an idiot, I'm just going to get myself in trouble. Yeah. So we teach that. That was something that was drilled right away. So when you're operating high, hot, high altitudes, you understand what power limitations are. And that's a big deal for all helicopters, even for the Chinook. The only thing is, like you said, we have a little bit more uh, shaft horsepower where, and, and we keep getting more from what I hear. I think we're getting a new type of engine that brings it something to like 70, uh, don't quote me, something like 7,000 plus horsepower per engine. Wow. Where before it was like somewhere in the near, in around a 5,500 shaft horsepower per engine. Mm. So, so yeah, where in Afghanistan, perhaps... A Black Hawk can affect a rescue or something of the sort above 10, 11, 12,000 feet. We were able to do it. Yeah. Hence, that's why there was quite a few, from what I understand, where they, uh, a few uh, Air Force rescue teams were using the Chinook in some places to do some effect rescues wherever they were at at certain altitudes. So, yeah, but we're very power conscious. That's a huge thing. And that's why flying in Alaska. Because we had the whole state of Alaska was like our training ground. So we would, wow. just, we would just write a perform, performance planning card. That's what we look at. Verify our numbers based on our current conditions, current weight, what we expect to land at and where we expect to land at. And we, we used to go launch and just go play in Alaska. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's no better play. I've never been anywhere else like that other than Afghanistan. And even that was restrictive because I was worried about pressure plates on top of mountains. Ooh. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. When was your first deployment as a pilot? Uh, that was in, so one thing that I do have to say, and I, I do have to mention this because we lost some guys that time and it was, we had a deployment in 2007 that was to Iraq and we had some guys, uh, that if, if you don't mind, do you mind if I say their yeah, names? Yeah, okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. This is dry ice 41. This happened in 14 August 07. And it was CW2 McFarland, CW2 Johnson, which was one of my best friends, Staff Sergeant Fisher, Staff Sergeant Reynolds, and Specialist Jewel. Um, they were doing a maintenance test flight at their home base. Something happened in the off rotor. I couldn't tell you. I never heard. I'm sure that the Chinook gods will know what happened. But essentially, they pitched up and went straight down into the ground from like a thousand feet. And that's all there was. Uh, so they all lost their lives there in 2007. I happened to be back in Alaska during that time. And I flew out to meet uh, Chris and take him to his wife uh, in a little box. So I just want to make sure that people don't forget that because that was a pretty important day in my life. And I'll never forget that day. But anyways, so I missed that deployment. Yeah. And then the next thing uh, I went down to, so leading on to this deployment that I'm telling you about, from Alaska, I went and became an instructor pilot. I got a pilot in command. Got signed off because I think 
You were just racking hours, like yeah. I'm, I, well, right. when, well, when they left to go on deployment, I was left with a few instructor pilots in Alaska. I'll just say his first name, Jason. I think Jason got tired of flying all the missions and wanted to play golf. So they signed me off as pilot in command. <laughs> so that way I could go flying and then they could play golf most of the day. <laughs> that uh, sounds like a decent trade. Yeah, that sounds right about right. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, so I almost killed myself a few times after I got signed off. And then I figured that I probably shouldn't do that. Um, and which by the way, I almost took out the brigade sergeant major with us when I was doing stupid stuff. But that's, what were you doing? All right. <laughs> all right. So we were doing some training and uh, I got training. Kind of, Jason, if you're out there, if you listen to this now, you'll hear it finally. Cause I've never told anybody. <laughs> um, we vowed not to ever say anything. Um, so I got signed off and then the next day we we're doing, uh, we we're going to go fly some of back office brigade staff to kind of go look at a glacier. So I was like, cool, we'll, we'll send Yvonne with some other guy to go do it. Uh, I was like, cool, sweet, I'm signed off. So I do it and I'd always heard of this black cat takeoff. Black cat takeoff? Black cat takeoff. So in a Chinook, so you have two rotors. Yeah. The rotors counter rotate. Yeah. They rotate, the, the forward rotor uh, is counterclockwise while the aft rotor is clockwise. So they do this, right? They yeah. turn towards each other. Well, what happens in the Chinook, the wave differential... Uh, collective pitch and tandem rotor aerodynamics. See, we can go down a rabbit hole that people will be like, what are you talking about? Tandem rotor yeah, anyways, aerodynamics. So we get into that. Everyone and, is now tuned out. Yeah, like, <laughs> everybody's like, huh? So anyways, the gist of it is I can perform a max performance takeoff if I put left pedal, because you've, you've yeah, yeah. left pedal, I can circle around the center of the aircraft, putting both of those rotors in clean air. As long as I keep the cyclic centered, which is what I used to go up, kind of forward, aft, left, and right. If I keep that thing perfectly centered, I can rotate around the center of the aircraft and shooting up into the sky like you wouldn't believe. I can peg out the VSI, vertical speed indicator, and go as, you know, just launch it. So and this is called a black hat takeoff. Yes. Got, where where did this come from? Uh, like, it's is a, this like a rumor, a, like when you're in it's, I don't know, to be honest with you, it came from a unit, one of the units out there. And I don't know that, I'm sure some guy did it and guys were like, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and people just kept trying it, but I was dumb enough to actually try it. I'd always heard about it. I'd never seen anybody do it. And they're like, all right, so what do you do? Okay. You put, get light on the, on the, on the tires of the aircraft. Then what you do, one guy will call the power, call the max, perf max torque available or max performance that you can get. And then the guy flying, center that stick and pedal deflection to the left. And we just spiral up kind of like a corkscrew. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see this. <laughs> we need to look on YouTube if this exists. I don't know if it does, to be honest <laughs> so with you. So you've got a bunch of brigade staff in the back. Well, I know I have the brigade sergeant major in the back. I know he's there. So... Um, <laughs> To go look at a glacier. Yeah, we're going to go look at this glacier. This is in Fort Greeley. Does Alaska. your crew know that, that you're going to do the this? Other crew chief? The other pilot knew. Yeah, but the, you got two dudes well, hanging no, out listen, the windows. Listen, the crew chiefs, <laughs> they know. They're not yeah. stupid. Those yeah. guys know when They're I say, listening. all right, guys, clear up left and right. I'm going to do a black hat. They know what's up. <laughs> like, they know what's up. They're not dumb. Those guys are awesome, by the way. Um, so anyways, all right, clear up. Like, you know what's funny? I don't remember who the crew chief was, but if he listened to it, he'll be like, that mother. <laughs> but anyway, so I tell Mike, uh, Mike, I'm like, all right, let's do this. And he's my PI. He's my co-pilot. I said, you watch the torque, man. Call the torque and make sure that I don't fuck this up. So we do it. Boom. We launch. And I, I pull all the power, pull left pedal, and we start course crewing. And we launch off the ground. It's like, I mean, I was like, shit. And, you know, kind of that time where you're like, you're just holding on. Yeah. You're not in control anymore. And that <laughs> was just right spinning. away. Yep, yep. And I'm launching... And 
the big thing is making sure you keep that cyclic centered because as soon as you take if, that cyclic, you do you're anything. changing yeah. aerodynamics significantly. So we went from spinning around a perfect center of the aircraft to then starting to oscillate. So we start oscillating. And I was like, oh shit. And by, I mean, we're in it. We're doing it. And I'm like, and I remember that we start getting pinned towards the side of the cockpit. Yeah, so the G's, the G's is now yes. throwing you. Oh gosh, there's some other people going, really, dude? <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. I, I tried it. I learned from it. I became a good guy afterwards. <laughs> yeah. You know, but Black anyway. Can't take off. So, anyways, um, anyways. So I'm pinned and I look at Mike and he's pinned, but he's holding on. There's like all kinds of little things that we can hold on in the cockpit, like formers and stuff like that. And he's holding on. And this whole time in my head, first I said, you're an idiot. Second, I was like, how am I going to get out of this? And I was like, I'm thinking forward airspeed, forward airspeed, forward airspeed. I need to get forward airspeed. I need to do something to get. So I started kind of slowly, like as the oscillation was going, obviously I was trying to take the pedal out, but then finding a way to, to make sure that I'm in, control to be able to yeah. so all i thought was four days three four days so i slow down the spin and then eventually get out of it and fly out well i look at mike and mike has got his face shield down those dark pilot yeah. cool guy pilot face shield and i can see the sweat coming down his so we're not talking i'm not saying anything he's not saying anything to me and we're just like <laughs> the tapes are clean you know like, <laughs> you know we're not saying anything and uh, and eventually like First, I had to get my asshole out of my mouth because I was I was scared. Like I was really scared. I thought I was going to kill us. Well, yeah, because that oscillation, there's you can't just no. pull pedal out. No, and hit right pedal. You're no. going to freaking tumble. <laughs> I'm going to twist things. I'm going to break things. Yeah. You just can't do that. You're stuck in a spin. You 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 did a reverse flat spin. <laughs> Pretty much. I was upside down and I was flipping the Russian guy off as I was doing it. Uh, so, anyways, so I do this. Get out of it. We go do this flight, and I'm just cutting a lot of stuff out. I go do this flight, land, land at this glacier, come back, and I get out of the cockpit, and the brigade sergeant major, and everybody's hanging out and doing their thing, high five, ain't cool, man, it's awesome. And I'm like, I got a first. I went to Mike and I said, I, man, I just want to apologize, dude. I'm sorry. And he's like, no, man, it's all good, man. We're good. Yeah. I was like, it was. I went with your idea, and I'm like, yeah, I know you did, <laughs> but like, you're supposed to back me up and like say that's not a good idea. Like, you should not do that. Bad, Yvonne. So, so I get that with Mike, and Mike and I are like, oh, glad we're alive. That was that was the first flight. After I got signed off, like the guy signed the paperwork and they're like, you're a pilot in command. And I was like, you all right, let's full black hat. Yep. I went, <laughs> no, I went full retard. And we know that you never go full retard. You just don't, you don't. So I did that. And, uh, and then I went to the star major and you'll know this stuff. Like, you know, they give coins out yeah. for cool shit. And I'm like, Hey, star major, I just want to shake your hand. And, and I was going to apologize to him. And he shakes my hand before I can shake his. And he gave me a brigade coin. And he was like, dude, the Mr. Cruz, that was the best takeoff I've ever experienced in my entire life. You're an awesome <laughs> pilot. <laughs> and he gave me a brigade coin for it. And was like congratulating me. And everybody's like clapping. And like, dude, that's the best thing ever. <laughs> and I'm looking at the whole crew. And we're all like looking at each other. I'm like, little did you know. Yes. We were like, we didn't know if we were coming out of this one. Yeah, like, I think we were gonna <laughs> die. And I still have that coin. You know, Dude, people have those little coins. I think that's the greatest aviation story I've heard to date. <laughs> All right, I guess we're done then. So, yeah. so, but no, so that, that, I did that. That's how I got some, scratched that one off. That's how I got that. So I became a PIC and I went to become an instructor pilot back in Fort Rucker. So I went back to the schoolhouse. Um, willingfully, you wanted to let people that have never flown an aircraft <laughs> try it out with you? Well, I mean, I already <laughs> did an inverted flat spin, so I figured I could handle that. <laughs> See, the sad thing is, is you didn't tell anybody about this. So you're not the famed black cat takeoff, no, the guy that actually did it. <laughs> somebody told me that somebody had recorded it, but I'm pretty sure it's not out there. I mean, it's already been so long. This was back in like, I don't know, 2000. Seven. I want to see this. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, I can look for it and see if it exists anywhere, yeah. but I guarantee you it won't look as amazing as it did when we were sitting there pinned against the edge of the cockpit, <laughs> wondering if we were going to be okay. 
So that was one of the dumb things that I did. And after that, remember we were talking about earlier about an aviation, you just go like, yeah, maybe I, sh- I should not do that. You should that. not do that. Yeah, that's not a good idea. So I'm more safety at bir- or safety conscious now. So I became an instructor pilot in, uh, in Fort Rucker and then flew there with the wind jammers. And uh, so going back to your question, the answer to your question is, then you said, well, when was my first tour? Well, they were, they were needing people uh, at 10th Mountain Division. Colossal to go deploy because they were getting ready to do another turn to Afghanistan. So I kind of sort of raised my finger and it was like literally like the hand of God grabbed me from my seat and like threw me to Fort Drum, New York. Yeah. And and I went and became part of that unit, which I didn't even make it out of the guest housing, you know, like lodging. Yeah. Like I literally got the lodging and I deployed from my lodging. Like, <laughs> yeah. So I got there just in time to get my my issue, meet the guys. And I remember the senior pilot right away was like, what do you bring to the table? And I was like, oh, shit. It's, it's gonna, a black hat table. Okay, it's going to be like, no, I didn't say, <laughs> trust me, I didn't say that. But I was just like, oh, gosh, here we go. But that guy ended up being a really good guy. But yeah. he was he was just a tough hammer kind of guy. Like, he'll hammer your stuff if you don't have it right. And that's generally how we are, man. We want to make sure guys are squared away and they're not stupid. We play hard, but we but we also get things done the way that we should. So I launched there, that was 20, uh, 2010 into 2011. And from there, we went out to uh, the sandbox and played there. What was the majority of your missions? Were you infilling guys or just carrying shit or transpo? <laughs> it, it started off with uh, what we call ash and trash, which is just the red, red, green route going from point to point to point to point to drop stuff off. And I quickly realized that I didn't like that. And before you start doing like that high speed, low drag stuff, you kind of have to prove yourself yeah. to being a good guy to be on a time sensitive, time on target type mission. So it started off that way. Uh, by that time, I was already an instructor pilot. So I'm established. I know yeah. what I'm doing. I had had a, an incident out at NTC, which kind of spooked me because it was under goggles and, and it kind of spooked me. So then going to the sandbox to operate under night vision in the elements, it, initially kind of had me a little, yeah. you know, gun shy. But then once you get into the role, you rip, uh, relief in place, and then getting on with it, initially ash and trash. And then we rolled right into, it seems like we shifted. It's like the timeline shifted during 2010 and 11, where we went from doing a lot more of support stuff to then doing a little bit more time sensitive, high value target stuff. So it went from moving shit to then high speeds onto Throwing whatever on targets. Exactly. And, and then that became, so I went from day flying to just pure night vision, uh, goggle flying that whole rest of that time. And we shifted from places like, uh, Bagram to J bad to Sharana to shank. And it was just like a, we used, I think we used to call it the, the traveling, the traveling, uh, time on target team or something like yeah. that. Like we were just going around doing missions <laughs> just all around. And that was the the bulk of it after that was just at night, every night, damn near every night um, missions. So, That's cool. Yeah, that was that was the most fun. I mean, there's nothing you, uh, better than that. When you drop them off, do you go to a BP or a stage point that you hang out at that's cleared? Yeah, typically. Or do you go back? Like, how does that work? It's all, it's all, <laughs> the, it's, it's funny because it's, it's like every answer in the middle. It's all mission dependent. Um, and without getting, I won't get into a bunch of exacts of what we yeah. do or how we, how we did it. But what I will say is that everything's set up that way. And, and sometimes depending on where you're at, like if the mothership, if, it, if we're doing something right outside of the mothership, well, we'll just go back to the mothership. Yeah. If it's forward stage somewhere in the mountain of whatever bad, um, then we might forward stage at a place like Bob or something, lightning or something like that. And then from there, we'll just monitor. Yeah. And depending on the situation... Then we'll either spin up based on what we're hearing. So that way we are Johnny on the spot, ready to go. Because, you know, time is, time is of the essence. If something happens if, and if somebody gets hurt, which we've had guys Do you guys, guys roll like, with escorts? Yes and no. Um, y- it depends. So <laughs> back to, again, if we're going to an area that we know we can probably encounter some sort of opposition, then it just makes sense to roll in with those guys. Sometimes we would meet with them in route. Like we would just make an in-flight join up. They take us to wherever we're going, make sure we get in there safely and out of the AO. And then they just continue to remain nice. overhead. As you know how those guys work, they'll just kind of remain depending on what you ask them to do. Yeah. Um, 
and we come back, but it's all trigger based. Everything's off of what we're hearing on the radio. So if, so if we hear specific this or specific that, then we, we execute that, that contingency based on it. So it's, it's, it's awesome because once you, like once you get everybody lined up, the person you're supporting, the customer you're supporting, you as a unit, the people above you and below you, like it just runs like a fine tuned machine. Yeah. Like it's just a V12 hollering. It's amazing. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So was that a PCS to 10th Mountain then? So when you come yeah. home, are you now in New York? Yeah, pretty much. Like, yeah, I, I went, I went, deployed 10, uh, 10, 11. And then 10, 11, I, after 11, we came back to, to Fort Drum, New York. And then now I'm part of the unit. Now create the crazy part is that I'd never even done anything with that. I, I got there, deployed with them, had never even seen the company area, had never oh. met anybody else, never seen the battalion. I mean, yeah, I'd seen it, but it was kind of like signing in and, and leaving. So then I finally got to actually kind of like integrate with the rest of the unit that was there. And as you know, in big divisions, whether it's down at Bragg or, you know, Hood or 10th Mount, whatever, it's like you're there, you're deploying, getting ready to deploy, or you just got here, or you're going to NTC, JRTC, getting ready to go yeah. again. So that was like, it went right back to like, okay, so we're deploying next year at this time. or So we went back to reset rearming and right back. So that way we could get out again. And, and so that was just a whirlwind of training, 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 making sure stuff is good to go, getting new instructor pilots, new pilots, everybody spun up yeah. to get ready to go again. And that's what that was like at uh, 10th Mountain. And from there I deployed again. Um, and that was, I believe, uh, 13 to 14 or so, yeah, 13 to 14 again. And that was straight into um, uh, more, not, did we call it Mortaritaville? or Rocket City in Shank, Afghanistan, and it's back to the same. And that was even more of the, just doing time on targets. That was just nonstop, again, back to the same. So it was kind of nice because by that time you've been, you're accustomed to how things go. So you're not yeah. coming in, like trying to figure shit out. Like you're actually coming in and able to just like go right into it and execute it. So that was really good. And we had some pretty sporty, sporty times there to say the least. So I, I'll tell you about a funny one. I think you might think this is funny. Um, so in a Chinook, we have generally uh, out in the sandbox downrange, we'll fly with, you know, either a gunner, just a, a gunner, a 240 gunner or something yep. like that. And then a crew chief and a flight engineer. Those are my non-rated crew members. They're there to make sure that I don't mess things up. And then obviously two pilots, sometimes a guy on the jump seat, depending if we need somebody that needs to manage what we're doing a little bit better, like a mission commander of sorts. And so I'm landing at this uh, landing zone, LZ, and it's one of those two wheel pinnacles. Again, like we talked about, the one where you set the aft landing gear and you kind of yeah. do this little teeter totter deal. And I'm landing, I'm trying to land at this place and it's dark, man. I can't see anything. I, I see the drop off. It's like a damn near like a 2000 foot drop off. So I'm just hovering and I'm looking down. I don't see anything. I have to look behind me to see what's where I'm actually trying to land. And the thing to explain in Chinooks is like, we depend on our non-rated crew members so much because yeah, they fly, to. yeah, they fly me from the back. Like when we get to a, to a landing zone, they're the ones saying, Hey, come forward, five, four, three, two, one, clear, come down, you know, clear left and right. So when they're talking, I disconnect my brain from flying and then I let them fly the aircraft through my yeah, hands. Yeah. So I'm doing this. I'm kind of just looking, looking around and then landing. And then based on what they're saying is how I'm adjusting the control. So it's really important for us to have a really good relationship, yeah. which is what we always have generally in the Chinook community. <clears throat> so anyways, I'm trying to land. And, uh, and this uh, flight engineer, he's like, hey, sir, um, we got a tree out the left. So I just want to make sure that we don't do that. So just just do exactly what I say. And I'm like, all right, sounds good. I'm going to do what you say because that's what I always do. So I'll do it. And he's like, all right, just kind of hold your left. You know, I don't want to get too close to this tree. So, but we'll be okay. And I'm like, okay. So again, he knows what he sees, what I can't see. So I'm just going to do it. So I land it, let these guys out. We do our thing and then um, get the mission done. Good to go. High-fiving, doing that cool stuff. And then I do a post-flight which is a walk around of the aircraft, just check for any battle damage assessment or anything. 
And the side of the aircraft has all these gashes and scratches on the side of it. Like, I mean, like somebody took a bat and started beating on and scratched it and ripped it, kind of not ripped it off, but like if you had a giant bear going, you know, scratching it. And I was like, hey man, what the fuck? Over. I was like, what happened, dude? He's like, well, I told you about the tree. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I thought the tree was outside of the rotor disc, you know, outside of where I have a big spinning fan that we could hit and potentially like, no, 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 no. It was like literally like two or three inches away from where we were trying to land. So I was like, so we were rubbing against a tree that was inside of our rotor disc that was that close to hitting the rotors. He's like, oh yeah, but I know you were good for it. So we just, so again, it's one of those. <laughs> so I knew you were good for it. I was like, what? what? I was like, like are this, you serious? This is a confusing moment. You just did something that we did, that would have ruined us, but you're inflating my ego right I now. Like, Thanks, I should man. be mad. But I like what you said. But I, hi- <laughs> but I high-fived him and I was like... But you're right. I am good right. for it. So after that, I'm like, oh, just let you know, I put a scratch on. It's no big deal. It's just a tree. What was it? Oh, just inside a rope. It's no big deal, it's man. No it's big not deal. a big deal. No, don't big worry. Deal, it'll man. buff off. Nothing that a little freaking... Call, but, it, you know, but, but, but it was... No, it. no, no. It was just, What's funny is just, that, that that year, we messed up so many aircraft trying to do the mission that our maintenance test pilots were getting so mad. Like, so pissed. <laughs> We'd come back with holes because... We were one of those like get it done kind of things yeah. as long as it's within the confines of safety and we don't endanger ourselves to a certain extent. So I did another landing. I, I landed and I'm like, man, this is literally the most stable landing I've ever done. It was the best landing ever. And I was like, that's so cool, man. I was like, man, this is good. I must be really getting good. And I, we took off and landed. And I checked the back of the aircraft. There's a huge hole in the aircraft like this big, a couple of feet. And I'm like, hey, dude, what happened? He's like, well, I cleared you down and I told you there was a little thing here. And I'm like, so I didn't know you were going to peg us into this freaking rock. It was like a pointy rock. And literally we pegged into it. And I was like, no wonder my landing was so like stable is because we were literally like impaled ourselves into a freaking rock. <laughs> so I was like, some of the best things I've ever done were just purely by like accident. And then I go back, I tell the maintenance pilot, you know, the... The, the squadron commander, I was attached to a cavalry squadron. Then yeah. he's like high-fiving. He's like, dude, way to get the mission done. high five. Like he was just awesome coins and stuff. The maintenance test pilot was like cussing us because we left with like four or five aircraft and we came back. We call it Red X when an airplane is a no-go. You can't go flying anymore. Like we came back and pretty much every aircraft was Red X. We broke every <laughs> single one of them doing the mission. So he's just pissed off at us. So that's just a funny story about how nights would go, you know? <laughs> Well, since leaving the army, now what are you doing? So the people that know me know that I've been a pretty passionate aviation guy. That's all I've ever wanted to do. It's everything I've ever wanted to do. Everything I've ever wanted to do. I don't want to do anything else. I'm a one trick pony, period. I have nothing else that I can do that I'm good at <laughs> um, other than flying. I hope I'm good at it at least. Um, and so during the time that I was in the military, I got all my ratings. So I put to use that GI Bill that everybody wastes a lot of the time. And I would take leave. I would take 30-day 30, 30 leave uh, block leaves and I would go out to St. Charles Flying Service in St. Louis, Missouri and I would just knock out flight training. Instrument. Yep. So I would go out there for Double 30 days range. and I would literally be like, all right, let's get this and I'm going to fly every day as much as I can possibly fly to get things done. Uh, and this was with the intent of eventually becoming an airline pilot. While I was in the army flying helicopters, I got accepted to a refueling squadron in Alaska at Ielsen, oh. the 168th Air Refueling Squadron. But for circumstances that are not under my control, that got taken away. Um, and so, again, my ultimate goal is still become an airline pilot. So I was getting all this stuff. Then while I was my last, so I went from Fort Drum, New York. I went to Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. So that was... <laughs> your, yeah. your freaking duty stations really sucked. Why? <laughs> Schofield Barracks Hawaii is awesome. Yes, I know. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you flew helicopters in Alaska and Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess that's... You no, know, I, I got lucky because the guy, one of my friends was in uh, Human Resources Command. So it was kind of one of those like, hey man, can you help me out? Well, I got a Hawaii if you want to go there. I'm like, yeah, I'll take that. You know, What year was that? This is like right after we got back. So if it was 13, 14, like right at 14, I, I left there and then went to, to Hawaii. And in Hawaii, I kept getting, again, I got my instrument rating, got my multi yeah. uh, stuff there or started some multi training there and kept flying. Then I got a job flying 
robber dog shit out of Honolulu. Um, well, no. It was flying other things, but I was flying with a small company, <laughs> flying the Cessna Caravan, the 206 Caravan. Yeah. And that's an amazing airplane. If you've never flown on it, if you have. get a chance to fly, that's a cool airplane. <laughs> you can land that literally in anywhere. 10 feet. <laughs> yep. Yep. And when you pull the power back on that thing, it's like you put a speed brake out. It's an amazing little airplane. So that was the first like kind of like legit airplane I flew after flying like a Piper Warrior and a Cessna 172 and those basic training yeah. uh, airplanes. So I flew that, did a little bit of cargo flying at night. So um, while I was a standardization pilot during the day, what I would do is at night I would go flying. I would get up like at one in the morning, head out to the Honolulu airport, be there by like one forty-five or so, go flying from like that time until about 6.30 in the morning because I used to skip PT because I could. So I would just skip PT and then from there, I would leave that job and then go straight to Schofield Barracks to the office and do like normal instructor pilot stuff yeah. and then do that over and over. So that's kind of how I built a little bit of time. And that led me to when I retired in 2017, there was a big push in a lot of the, a lot of all, just about every pilot out there will know what happened there in that 2017 timeframe. There was a big shortage of pilots. So just about everybody that could get into the world, the commercial flying world started doing so. And I just <laughs> happened to hit the time frame like, right. Like it was the perfect storm for me. Yeah. And I left from there and went to, and did some more training, got some more multi-engine training complete, and then joined Envoy Airlines. At Envoy Airlines, I flew the Embraer 145 for a little bit, uh, based out of JFK and LaGuardia, and yeah. then also Dallas for a little bit. Um, very, very quickly, I realized that it's just not my cup of tea to fly people. Yeah, no. It doesn't it's, sound fun. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, I spent my whole life wanting to sit in airplanes, and now when I sit in an airplane, I can't stand Stand it. I hate it. <laughs> like I hate people. I don't want to see them. I don't want to sit next to them. I don't want you to talk to me. I just put my AirPods in and just leave me alone. So I try to avoid it if, if at all possible. Hence, that's why I want to own my own airplane. Yeah. So I don't have to worry about that stuff. So uh, I left Envoy and I got a shot by chance. Seems like a lot of things happened to me by chance. I, I was looking at this company called Western Global. It's a kind of a an on-demand cargo type outfit, yeah. but that does international stuff. And I was just trying to find a place. I was trying to build up my time like we always do in any kind of job where you're trying to build up enough experience to become somebody. Yeah. And I happened, I saw a number and I called the lady and I was like, hey, listen, my name is Yvonne Cruz and I'm just trying to find out what I need to do to make enough, get enough experience to where somebody like yourself will hire me. And she was like, well why don't you send me a resume right now? And I'm like, I know I don't have enough like legit experience to get hired, but I'm like, I'm going to send it anyway. So I sent it and I got an interview, an inter interview. And I did pretty well. And most airline interviews, uh, for the most, in case you don't know, most of the time there's of course like an HR type, like, well, tell me about yourself. Why do you yeah. want to fly? What do you know about us? And then there's a little bit of uh, understandings of, reg of regulations, federal air, uh, regulations mm -hmm. and things of that sort basic aerodynamic things. So that way they want to make sure that you know what you're talking about. And then a lot of times there's an actual flight uh, in a simulator, in a full motion simulator, they do an evaluation of your flying skills. Oh, wow. So yeah, so you do all this stuff and mind you, I've only been flying a small airplane, which Embraer was somewhere around 49,000 something pounds, mm -hmm. max gross weight, to where now I'm doing this, at this interview, I'm flying this 630,000 pound airplane and trying to fly and get a feel for it. And thankfully, I, I have to say that my helicopter flying helped me because yeah. I understand finesse and flying and not over controlling and things of that nature. So I did really well and I got hired. There I flew the MD-11, McDonnell Douglas MD-11 to a three engine airplane, yeah. huge airplane, 630,000 pounds. Damn. Um, and that's where I learned big and big airplane flying where the Embraer was understanding how to fly in the 121 world. And for people who don't know what 121 is, that's just like your normal airline operations regulations. Anybody that flies, like if, if, if you're flying cargo in the U S like FedEx, UPS, that type, that's 121. If you're flying passengers, you're flying like as an American type, that's 121 flying. So you learn, you start building all that 
all that knowledge. So that way, when you move to a bigger outfit, a more well-known outfit, you have all that skill and experience. They don't have to teach that to you. You're expected to know. So then on the, on the Western global side, I learned the international side where I'd been flying regionally in a small little puddle jumpers left and right. Now there I'm going to places like Spain, France, Germany, Belgium. And oddly enough, it's a funny story. Um, I was sitting in, uh, I'm doing a flight uh, downrange. I won't say where, but I'm going downrange from a base here in the U.S. And one of the things that we always do in this airplane is we walk the load. We verify that all the locking pins are locked, everything's secure, straps yeah. are correct, like all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. we don't need a load shift, which by the way, if anybody, <clears throat> have you ever, by any chance, did you see that 747 that, that went down? Yeah, it was a, a MRAP. Yeah, that that's broke. a load shift. Yeah. That's why, because things need to be secured pro- uh, yep. appropriately and that didn't quite happen there. So I'm not trying to be that guy. Which, by the way, those guys fought it all the way through, which is crazy because it's just an insane situation to be in because there's nothing, there's nothing they could have done. There was no way they were going to, nothing. You're stalled. Yeah. And, and they pretty much, when they contacted, they were pretty much almost, you could say, you could see that they're fighting it the whole time and they just kind of pancaked into the ground at the end of the runway there. So anyways, that's why we walked the load. So we walked that load and I'm looking at the, uh, is it called URN? URN, the unit. No, UIC, Unit Identification Code, UIC. Yeah. And I'm looking at the connexes and I'm like, hold on, dude. I'm like, dude, this is my unit from 10th Mountain Division. My old unit, like yeah. Bravo Company 310. <laughs> and I'm like, holy shit. And I'm like, dude, I'm flying my stuff from my old unit. I didn't know this. Yeah. But somehow I managed to fly my old unit stuff back into in country <laughs> as a commercial pilot. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. So I called my buddies that way. I'm like, are you guys here? And they're like, yeah, we're here. And I'm like, well, guess who's bringing your shit? <laughs> who's bringing your rogue equipment? Who's bringing your gym equipment? This guy. And I took a picture <laughs> and I'm like, I'll be here at this time. If you guys want to hang out, we can go to the Green Beans and maybe, yeah. you know, go to Bakalakadaka Street and, and <laughs> do our thing. So that's one of those situations where I got to, it's weird how full circle, yeah, how paths cross again. And here I am and I did it again. So anyways, I get all this experience there, but this company is, is not in the best shape in terms of contracts. We keep getting contracts. We lose contracts, get contracts, lose contracts. And in in the aviation industry, one thing that you don't want to do, there's something, there's a difference between being qualified and proficient at anything. I was qualified and I remain qualified, but I don't know that I was proficient at flying that airplane like very well, considering that we're taken to this place, Africa and Afghanistan and places. And it's a very intricate plane to fly. It's not an easy plane to fly. So I started getting concerned about how good was I with being like that? Like I'm good with doing some high speed, low drag fun stuff, but I want to make sure I got all the boxes checked and everything. So I started looking elsewhere and a buddy of mine told me about another company flying uh, the Boeing 767-757 um, flying freight for a well-known company. And I won't say the name of this company, but anyways, most of the guys out there probably know which one it is. Most of the pilots will know. But so from there, I gained all this interna- international experience and all this stuff and how to fly a big airplane. So then when I go to this company, even though I don't have the most time, the most experience of them all, I bring what's, re- what's good to have to then make the transition as painless as possible. And that's happened now. That's been about a year and two months or so. And that was a transition to, uh, again, Boeing 767-757. And I've been flying that ever since. That sounds fun. It is fun. (laughs) I'm not going to lie to you though. Like I I do miss my military time and my buddies know that I do because I talk to them about it all the time, like (laughs) all the time. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's something that I'll never, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy about what I did. I miss what I did, but I tell you what, like the people I'll ask you, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Like when you left the military, like, there's always a few guys while you're in that you're like, really, dude, why are you here? Like, you suck. But then you leave and then you realize that you're amongst a percentage of people that, that is very particular and they're really good. 
but you don't realize that until you leave. Oh, yeah. Now, I don't know, maybe mine is a specific situation, but then I went like, oh my gosh. Now, granted, I'm not talking bad about people. I'm just saying that, yeah. I'll say this, not all pilots are created equal. I know that for sure, a hundred percent. Some people are more driven than others. Yeah. And I thought that leaving, everybody was going to be like maverick and like walking in like, and it's not like that, <laughs> you know? So you're like, you're looking around. I'm like, doesn't everybody want to sit here and look at this, you know, approach profiles with me? And they're like, <laughs> no, I don't want to do that. You know, so, but it's one of the things that I realized from being in the, that I miss from the military is the fact that like I was amongst all these people that were there because they, I mean, some weren't there because they wanted to, they just had to do something. Yeah. But for the most part, they want to be there. Yeah. And, and it's just something that I learned afterwards that I wish I would have known. Like I, like I appreciated more when I was in because then I would have invested even more time than I did in the relationships that I had because yeah. they were amazing people. So I ended up where I'm at and now I'm flying. I'm enjoying my life. I absolutely love what I do. There's not a day that I don't like what I do. I never hate it. I like dynamic environments and, and here I am. And so if any of, uh, any of our people have questions on army aviation, how to get in, into it, or even this commercial, uh, cargo flying stuff, where can they hit you up at? What's your Instagram? Well, my Instagram is Spaniard 79. Uh, <laughs> the guys that know me know how I got that name <laughs> nice. as well. Uh, I got that one down range. Um, and just shoot me, shoot me an, you know, a DM or something like that. If there's anything specific that you have, and then we can go from there. Well, thanks very much. This was very interesting. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.